Hey there, welcome back to the final part of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way. I hope you found inspiration in our guest journey this week. Today, we'll leave you with some key takeaways and actionable insights that you can lean on. Now let's wrap up with some powerful lessons that can help guide you on your own path. Don't forget to tune in for a brand new guest next week on Monday. But for now, enjoy this week's. Please subscribe to the channel if you don't already as well. Have a great weekend. We'll see you soon. Yeah, I just think that is not an option. No, I agree. W w was it your dad who was driving? Yes. Yeah. And so what happened in that scenario, if you don't mind me asking, was it a, a pure accident? Was it an accident that could have been avoided? Was, did he just not see him coming? Was it head? Like, what was the, the picture there? So <clears throat> they were on the highway, um, on the Midland Highway. and Which is a one laner on both sides, or is it two? One. One, one. on each side going in either direction. Yeah. So um, dad was traveling 100 on the highway. And then there is a road that kind of comes up over a dip but comes to meet the highway. And then on the other side, there's like a dirt track. Um, so this person that hit dad came up over the track at a very um, high speed and not slowing down right until the last minute when they're out um, onto the highway. Now, it was said in the case because it's, you know, been to court and trial and all those things now um, that he micro slept. But, you know, I won't go into grave detail, but it, he was being charged with driving and being negligent because he had worked for such a huge amount of time and not slept, hmm. then went out and drove, um, of which is why they think he's micro slept um and done this so you know it admittedly he is at fault um but nothing really came out of the court case other than you know getting a smack on the hand and you know good behavior but I'm told not to do it again really um which a month to the day after having that collision with dad, he had another accident. And that was when he had his license taken off him, of which Permanent. should have happened the month before when he had hit dad. So, like, just those little things there, you know, used to really eat away at me. So that second accident a month later, um, was any major damage there or no life? I Involved in that, um, oh, right. he went off like out into a paddock, I think, and hit a fence. God, uh, I mean, you'd you'd think for years, if not forever, you'd be on alert when you're driving, right? I mean, if I do a little nudge because I'm tired, because you know, I, I'm human and I have made mistakes. I've never had an accident like that, but you know, I might have. Sometimes when I drive on these country roads here in Australia, it's just so straight. Because I used to think, how can somebody fall asleep like that? But now I live in Australia, in England, they don't really have the opportunity because it's just traffic everywhere and constant turning and changing of gears. But now I'm in an automatic and the roads are so straight here and you can go 100, it's kilometres an hour here, by the way, not miles per hour. Um, and, and you, you sometimes do feel yourself and I, straight, as soon as that happens, I'm, I'm alert for the rest of that journey, you know? Yeah. So it's, it surprises me that, he he's that's happened to him so if at all but so early on yeah. after a life changing altering even for him right yeah. even for that person it's 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 life altering or at least it should be and um, i think like you saying that too and like we've spoken about a few times there are things that annoy me in this case and mm. really eat away at me yeah and there are things that in the grand scheme of things Nothing out of this situation I have the control over mm. or I can change. So as shitty as it is and as hard as it is, I've chosen not to get wrapped up in it because I cannot change the outcome because it's not going to bring Dad back. 
It's not going to change what happened. I can't change that man. Mm. That's up to him. So what I can say is I hope that him living with the fact that he's done that to someone and someone's family is enough. Yeah. Because it has to be for me. It has to be, yeah. And, and, and we'll get into how you got to that mentality. I mean, I know we've already touched on it probably at the beginning, but was it always like that for you after it? Like what did life look like after that for the next few years? It was really hard because like, so where dad had the accident, I actually ended up living in that area um, wow. for a few years when I worked. Yeah. How long uh, after the accident? Uh, three years. Three wow. years after. Yeah. So it went to court in that spot. All of the trial and everything that was supposed to happen was supposed to happen there. Um, I often would see that man too in the same um, shop, like in the Coles there, I would quite often see him um, where I was living and that's not something that I could change or time differently. Mm. It randomly would happen. Um, but over time that did start to get to me a bit um, and I just thought, well, someday I don't want to want it to get to me and me snap and do something irrational I think I need to leave so I'm not potentially facing these things yeah. every day yeah so apart from leaving then did you seek any other support in your life to to help you mm. yeah so TAC um transport accident commission so if there is an accident on the roads uh they offer support to families and to victims, um, whether that's through, um, you know, counselling. We had five years of counselling for free. Mm. Um, there is monetary things if you are killed on the road, um, you know, several different things that they offer. Um, but for us, going back to like, did I do any other support? Yes, I did. Um, but it wasn't consistent. Yeah. I saw someone once in court and I did not like them and I, it's not a fault of their own, but I just didn't feel like it was the right connection or that they didn't understand why I was there. I just felt that I'd say what I needed to and then they go, and how did that make you feel? I was like, I've just been sitting here for the last two friggin' hours to tell you how I feel. Have you not been listening? <laughs> so, you know, there was that. So I ended up once the court case was finished, that's kind of when I think my body just went, I can let go of those rocks now. And I did and I just was angry and upset and was like, I'm not happy here anymore. Mm. I have to go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you have to. What was the biggest shift then for you, do you think, to get onto the, the, the pivotal part of your, your positive mindset towards this trauma? What was that biggest shift that you think you did? I think in the trial we actually, I don't know, it was supposed to go to trial. I guess it was a court case. Mm. It didn't go ahead because they ended up dropping certain charges. So that really pissed me off. Mm. But we had one chance to give victim impact statements. So I was adamant to get out everything that I needed to in that victim impact statement. Um, so I think that was a pivotal thing that I had my time and I knew that that was coming and I needed to get that off my chest so I wasn't hanging on to that. Um, the thing that really annoyed me is that out of all the years going through court and at any point in time he could have said that he was sorry for what he did and he never did. And that's what really annoyed me because it made what he said in court feel very disingenuous 
like, well, not once have you said you're sorry for what you did. You've just said what you have done Mm. and how it's affected you. Yeah. And, you know, he had a family too and how that affects him. And if I was that person and I did that to someone too, I can say how I think I would feel about it or what I would do, but I don't know that I would do those things because unless you're in that moment or in that, um, what's the word, in his shoes, I don't know. Yeah. So I don't know if that's what he did because the spotlight was on him in that minute and that's what he chose to say. Mm-hmm. But my sister and I read our victim impact statements and we read one out for my mum as well because she didn't feel she could do it, and rightly so. Um, But the thing that annoyed me is he never once looked up at us. So like the conversation that we're having now, if I wasn't looking at you but I was still having this conversation to you, it would seem like I didn't care. Hmm. Um. Was it shame, do you think? Uh, I don't know. I don't, I guess I can't judge Mm. that because I don't know him outside of what happened. Yeah. Um, And I can't judge his character, I guess. Um, But from what I saw, it was just, you know, if he met our our eyes, maybe he was finally admitting that he did something wrong. And I don't know if he felt he did. Mm. I think. Yes, it's classed as an accident, but I think him going out and doing what he was doing, you know, there was a high likelihood of an accident then not having one. Yeah. So it does make me think what type of mind frame, uh, mind space he would have been in or. For sure. I don't know. It's not up, I guess it's not up to me to get into that because. No, but you're allowed to feel what you feel as well, yeah. right? I guess I don't care to know. Yeah. If I'm honest, I don't care to know. Yeah. I felt it was very disingenuous and disrespectful. Yeah. And that I am only taking a fraction of your time. You can give me the respect to look at me and hear what I have to say. And mm. yeah, it'll hurt because what you've done is hurtful. Yeah. Um, oh. But yeah, I feel like I got got enough peace that day that I could walk out and break down if I wanted to because I was finally letting go of things. But that was three years of rocks on my shoulders. Like Yeah, it would be. It was a long time. Unimaginable. I can't I can't ever imagine that. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know what I, I can think what do. Out of everything too, the fact is that like my mum, for example, I I have my my family I've created a family here and they are very supportive and they're my world Mm. and my dad was that partner and he was part of that world for my mum and I can't give that back like I think the hardest part is that you can't make someone not feel lonely like she can be in a room full of people and still feel lonely and she's still got to go home to a house that doesn't have me there and my sister mm. and my dad there. It's just her. Yeah. And that does, silence is hard. Does she still, does she live on her own now? Yes, yeah, she does. How, how is your mum? I think I feel like we should know about your sister and your mum. How, how are they right now? Um... Look, I think my mum does a a great job of keeping herself busy and we give her the happiness that she needs to keep moving on. Yeah. And I guess that's my purpose in I just want to keep her as happy as she can be. And I think too, I, you know, when you've got a partner, like you've got a partner, I've got a partner, I couldn't think of my world without them or I could joke you know Adrian and I joke as in oh god you know I hope it's me first because you'll be fine like you've got it all sorted you'll be right without me Mm. but the thing is at the end of the day I do not know 
what I would do without him and my little fan. I just don't know. How, having yeah. everything that you've just said there and you can see how your mum's coping with life uh, i mean she seems to be coping pretty well now while you as you just mentioned but you you've just articulated the those little incident moment incidental moments like being going home to the house and things like that has with all of that in mind has that impacted how you or little habits that you have with your husband or, or um, whether it's quirky or if it's you know if it's the way you know are you yeah i don't know how to say it how do i ask that question yeah has it impacted how you in a good way it could be in a good way but as it has it done is there certain habits that you have towards your husband with that in mind then he he's one of the most caring people but also one of the most annoying people <laughs> <laughs> but also so am i um <laughs> but i think with us like I always say every night and he shits me to tears with it. I always say every night before we're going to bed, love you. And he'll, well, that's okay. That's nice. No, he'll always respond. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's like an episode of friends. Stop. Stop. <laughs> um, but like he does. I love you too. So, God damn it. <laughs> so that we laugh. Yeah. So that we can laugh about, it, but I won't go to sleep until he says it. And he goes to sleep so quickly that it really annoys me. But I'm like, I love you. And he's like, oh, yes, I love you too. Like, good <laughs> night. But, like, you know, it's a jovial, funny thing. But I just, you know, if anything happens, he should know that I love him. It's the yeah. same with my kids. I'm putting them to bed and even though they give me the shits all day and I'm so friggin' glad that they're going to sleep or hopefully going to sleep. Yeah, I'm like, I love you because I genuinely love you and you need to know that because if something happens to me tomorrow, you need to know that, you know, you yeah. mean everything to me. And I think too that's really hard in the fact that like I can't go back in time and be like, oh, you know, I didn't tell Dad that I loved him as much as I should have or I didn't take as many photos as I should have or all of those things because it was a different time back then. Yeah. I'd tell my dad that I loved him or, you know, the last phone call I had with him was just like it was an annoying phone call but it was a funny phone call to talk about. Like the last phone call was that <laughs> he'd rang me and asked me if, like, I'd taken some of his DVDs. He's like, where is my Billy Joel DVD and this DVD? I'm like, I don't know. I don't live with you. Like, why would I have them? You're like, I don't know. I just thought you would. Anyway, what are you doing today? Like, oh. real cross about it at the start. And then because he has no idea because he's the one that's put them somewhere. He's like, anyway, let's just shoot the shit. Yeah. Like, Well, that's and nice that you can have that memory. That's what you, I suppose that's what's powerful. And you have to make, keep that memory hmm. with you in that way don't you because otherwise you, you you know you have to be thankful and grateful that you had that conversation and not an angry conversation right you know yeah yeah i well, think too like with um you know nowadays that we can take so many photos and we have our phones and we can video something and mm -hmm. something happens we've got first steps happening and you're like oh i've got it on my iphone although that can be like terrible people are like oh you weren't in the moment you were too busy filming it um I do more of the filming and taking photos and I may not necessarily be in the photos but take all of these photos of my kids and videos of even the stupidest things and it's because I don't have them of my dad. Yeah. See, that's like, perspective because I have always been that person who's always got the, you know, the camera out and I'm like, stop, get your camera away. I don't, I just want to live in the moment. So I, I, you've just taught me something there. Yeah because you have the perspective of, of, of losing it. Right. So I, I, and having that for you giving me that foresight, if something was to happen to me or to my partner, right. You um, kids have all those things. Yeah. Like that's so yeah, straight away, like get your phone out as much as you want. Yeah. Yeah. But like no, if, thank you. Even voice, mm. like you can be triggered by a memory, like a song or, mm. a song or something like that. Yeah. What I miss most. And I was saying to um, my friend that wrote the article 
um, for me a few months ago that what I've missed the most, other than, you know, him physically being here and being here for kids and weddings and all of those things, is the fact that at my sport he used to be like the biggest hype person. Like Mm. he was loud and it was like you were the only person on the team because he was just like, I could have been the shittest player and he would have still been like yahooing about it that Mm. I was doing well or something like that or I got the ball. Um, And that's what I miss. Like I miss hearing the voice and because I'm not going to hear it again, like even his mobile phone, that gets disconnected. Mm. That voicemail of him recording, that's gone. Yeah. Like I don't have any, I don't have any messages on my phone from my dad because the phone that I had back then, I don't have now. Yeah. Therefore, I don't have any of those things. Yeah. And not that he was one to write text messages. It would most likely just be an okay or a yes or something for, you know, a question. But, you know, I, like, I make it a point to try and give my kids memories, like even having my handwriting, like a handwritten birthday card. Adrian and his family don't really do much with birthday cards or birthdays, and, and that's fine. That's what you do. But when Dad died... I just didn't have anything. I'm like, well, why don't I have a birthday card from Dad? Hannah's got a birthday card. And it's like, well, I kept it. And I was like, well, I threw it out because I was like, why do I need this piece of paper? But, like, it had his writing on it and it had, you know, love you and all of those things, which I'm not going to hear that again. And that's hard. And I think that... There's regrets there that are always going to be there, but I can't do anything about it. Yeah. So, Beck, um, if there was anything that we might have missed from our conversation today that you feel that is probably worth sharing, is, is there anything that you think that you might have forgotten or that we've not covered? Um, I guess it's a point to say that grief and trauma is very different for each person. Mm-hmm. So the way I've dealt with things or the way I've seen certain situations or dealt with certain situations are very different for each person and that they may last a lot longer or you may not even feel those things. So it's not um, the best thing to think that my way is the best way. Mm. I think each person is very different with grief. I know my sister and I, Um, found it very hard to be around one another probably the first six months or so after Dad died because we were just grieving so differently. I had the focus of getting back into uni, graduating, having to get a job, all of those things, so my focus had to be on that, Mm. whereas Hannah was very different you know, her life is very different to me where she was at that stage too. And um, I felt that anything I said to her wasn't what she wanted to hear. So I felt like I was constantly pissing her off just by answering the phone. You know, she'd call and say, hi, how are you? And I'd go, yeah, good, thanks. And she'd go, how are you? Good. And I'm like, oh, well, I've already snuffed it, you know. How are you guys now then? Oh, fine. Oh, yeah. We've been able to talk about those things too. Mm. But for a long time, you know, we had to almost grieve differently because of the stages of our lives we were in. Is she older or younger? She's older than me. Yeah. Yeah, she's two years older than me. Uh, yeah, two, nearly three years older. Does she acknowledge those, that mindset that she had on the phone to you, like that example you've just shared? Did she? Does she acknowledge now? Oh, I think we spoke about it. I guess it's not something that we really delve into very often. Yeah. She's definitely someone to know that we are two very different people. <laughs> um, you know, no, you know, even twins, I would say, grieve or experience things very differently. Or <laughs> not that I didn't feel her hurt or anguish, I just didn't show it. Yeah. And that's because I kind of made it my mission to be the pillar of strength for them 
even though Hannah may not have felt that she needed me to be that because she's older, she wanted to be that or yeah, I don't know, I just felt it was like my job or my purpose to do that and I had to be okay for them if they weren't okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I would I would just say that everyone is so different and that grief can hit you at whatever time. It could be, like we've spoken previously about, could be a song, it could be a memory, it could be a smell, it could be something that triggers you. I know that when I've had my children, it isn't straight away, but there'll be a day or a time that I might just look at my kid and I burst into tears because I'm like, oh, he isn't here to, to see that. experience this and he would have loved it. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, I even had like a reading done at the start of, I think it was last year, I think in March last year I had a reading done and I know people were either on that train or not on that train and I was very in the middle. But I was like, I just, I feel like I just want to get across something to him or know a few things. And the big thing that came across was that um, he met my children before they were given to me. And the fact that I mentioned nothing in the reading about my kids or about their names or their ages or genders or anything. And he came out and said, first off, I'm so honoured that you named your son after me and he is such a legacy, like I live on through him. And I just lost it. I was just like, oh, my God, like how I can't not have a belief in it when I've mentioned nothing and he knows that my son is named after him. Yeah. You know, and that he's like, um, you know, I've met your children I held them before you did all of these things and that he mentioned about my wedding because in my wedding bouquet I had a picture of him and he mentioned about in the wedding how he walked with me because he was there and, you know, stuff about what was said about him at the wedding and things. I was just like. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, certain things were. And it doesn't it doesn't matter for those who don't believe if 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 that's what you need for your own closure and it helps you in some shape or form. Yeah. Doesn't matter, does it? And but it, you're right, it's so specific. You, you like I've had that done to me too when I've went to see somebody I'm like how there's no way they would have known that. Like Yeah. So there's something there to be questioned, isn't there and go, well, there's something they're getting right. So Yeah, <laughs> yeah phenomenal. All right. Well, coming towards the end then, Beck. Um if somebody's watching this and has been through something similar has got a friend or a family member that's been through something similar uh, you might have just covered it in everything you've just said because that was very insightful and i think a lot of people could take that away with them to to at least help themselves in their own unique way like you've just mentioned everyone deals with everything differently but what what would be a good piece of advice that would be quite general for anyone that's gone through something similar to you whether it's losing a loved one through an accident or or, or, or it's a, a similar scenario um, I wouldn't be afraid to go through the emotional roller coaster of of how it goes. Yeah, you might feel totally fine one day, and you might feel, you know, the depths of loneliness the next day. Yeah, but I think in my experience, it was good to go with the flow with those certain things, and I. I guess I don't like or I feel bad when people say to me, oh, you must think of him every day. And I feel bad when I say, well, I don't. And that's not that I don't love my dad or don't miss my dad or anything like that. Like I don't go and visit the cemetery. It's just not something that I do or that I feel anything when I go there. Mm. I feel more when I talk about him or get the chance to think back about certain times and be like, oh, shit, that was funny. Or I'd much rather do that and have emotion there than be stuck in a rut and not be able to dig myself out. So I think, I guess, feel the feelings that you need to, but at the end of the day, you know, we're very lucky 
to be on this earth for whatever amount of time that we're on it. Yeah. Why not be the happiest that you can be and make a point in your life of doing things for yourself or for others mm. instead of dwelling on things that you cannot control or cannot change? Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, at the end of the day, these things have happened. I can't change them nor am I going to use all of my time and effort to do so yeah. because I'm not going to get anywhere. Great piece of advice. Great yeah. way to end the show. Well, my final question I ask everybody, mm -hmm. um, purpose is something you brought up and it's something that I do bring up in all the, uh, the episodes, but um, what do you think your purpose is in life? Um, I think to be a good person. Mm -hmm. um, and be someone that my kids respect, you know, look up to, but adore, I guess. I yeah. just, you know, yeah. I want to be a good, good role model to them in the fact that if something was ever to happen to me, they can look back on time as nice as what I do with my dad. Mm. You know, I only got 22 years with my dad. I hope my kids get a lot more time than that with me. But... Also, I wouldn't change that because I still feel like out of those 22 years, I was lucky for that entire time. Yeah. Like he was kind, he was funny, mm. he was a great mate, he was a great teacher, all of those things. And, you know, I think about in the future, obviously everyone passes away, but I think with my mum, I think how much of a support she is to me and how wonderful and how much she means to my kids, like they're going to know how great she is. And I need to do more of talking about my dad to my kids. I know that. Yeah. But I think it's a hard thing to do when someone isn't physically there to do it. But they're, young. they're young and you will. You've got that yeah. time, haven't you, for sure. Yeah. They're young and if they have questions, they can ask me. Exactly, yeah. And you, I'm sure you've got pictures around and th when they're ready, they'll ask those questions when they look deeper into that photo. They'll see it, but they won't think much of it at the moment, will they? They'll just look at it as another photo, I guess, maybe. I don't know. Well, um, believe it or not, I didn't actually have any photos up mm. of pretty much anyone um, until a few months ago when I put that photo up of my dad and that was actually mentioned in the reading too. He oh. said, why don't you have any pictures of me? In your <laughs> and I was like, well, I don't. He's correct. And I'm like, but I don't have really pictures of anything or anyone because our whole thing when we first got the house was, well, print off our wedding pictures and do all of that when we've renovated it to how we want it mm. to be. Mm. Then he's like, dust off the one out of the shed that's like it needs to come inside. Like, well, well, the yeah. fact that I've brought this up then, you need to put, put more photos <laughs> yeah, up. It's a sign. I'm sure you got pictures up. I was like, oh. <laughs> Icky moment on the podcast. Yeah. yeah. But, um, well, well, there's a sign, Beck. Yeah, oh. There's power and vulnerability and being honest, and that's honesty there. Like, I, know, I, I love that. Too, yeah, but... no, I, I love that. I'm, I'm glad that you were honest. So, you know, it's a very simple question, yet a hard one to answer. And it took me 38 years to figure out my purpose. So uh, I know I asked the guests that at the end and it's, you know, put, kind of putting them on the spot. But in all honesty, I like I like to get the brain to tri triggered to think about it. So uh, I'm glad I threw that one at you. So I um, my life purpose to put yeah. up in my house. Yeah, that's it. Well, thanks, Beck, for joining in on Leading Our Own Way. You're certainly leading your own way in the sense that you bring so much character and personality and vulnerability to the surface. It's brilliant. You're, you're creating a safe space with everything that you're doing and just showing your rawness. Keep being you. Don't ever doubt yourself. It's beautiful. Keep doing it. It Don't ever change. And um, um, thanks, for, thanks for being so vulnerable today. It's amazing. And uh, I hope you. you've enjoyed yourself. Thank you very much, Andy. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, have enjoy the rest of your day. Stay on the line. And um, to everybody else who's uh, watched, I know you'll be able to take something away from, from Bet because, you know, um, a lot of people go through this type of thing and um, people just need to sit in their emotions like Beg said before and, 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 and listen to other people's stories because it, it, there's a lot of power that comes with it. Um, and so, yeah, I hope you can all take something away from Beck's story today and journey. So thanks for joining us and make sure you come back for next week's guest. Um, have a great week, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>
Thanks for listening and watching Leading Our Own Way. So we can stay together forever and share more incredible journeys, please subscribe to the channel. That way you won't miss next week.